How do you top a combination like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, Irving Berlin, and Mark Sandrich? The answer is, you can't. All you can do is sit back and marvel at their creation. Top Hat, released in 1935 by RKO, is arguably one of the greatest musicals ever put on screen. The director of the film was Mark Sandrich. He had directed Astaire and Rogers in The Gay Divorcee, which was released in 1934, and he would go on to direct them in three more after Top Hat. Irving Berlin wrote the music, and Fred Astaire would later express such gratitude uh, at the fact that he was lucky enough to introduce music written by Irving Berlin. And Berlin loved the way Astaire sang his songs. Art director Van Ness Polglace was responsible for the fabulous Art Deco sets. And Bernard Newman uh, designed for Ginger Rogers those glorious gowns. And speaking of gowns and makeup and costumes, this is a Ginger Rogers hair and makeup test. It may also be for the movie In Person, um, which was also released in 1935. Um, which in which she starred with uh, George Brent, but she also wore her hair this way in Top Hat. She wore it that way, most notably in the cheek to cheek number. In this um, gown, which she said she had a part in designing with designer Bernard Newman. And we'll get to the famous story that you all know about later. The gown was Ginger Rogers' favorite from all of her films with Astaire, and she wore it in the two-shot publicity photos where you can really get uh, a good feel for the detail and the beautiful uh, brooch and feathering. Ginger really had a wide variety of uh, costumes in this film. They're just gorgeous. Um, this one kind of reminds me of the, of the natty suit that she wore in 42nd Street. This negligee and the to die for Art Deco bedroom set um, are from the great scene where she can't sleep because Fred is dancing in the room above her. Even though she was born a Midwestern girl, Ginger Rogers could really pull off the English riding habit. She wore this outfit for the number, isn't this a lovely day to be caught in the rain? And since we're hearing the strains of the piccolino in the background, here's the dress from the piccolino, um, front and back. This is one of the few dresses from the Astaire Rogers musicals that survives. Um, Ginger Rogers presented it to the Smithsonian in 1984, and it must have been a pretty surreal experience for her to stand next to that dress and know that people will be able to view it forever. I've been to the Smithsonian, but it hasn't been on display when I've been there, unfortunately. The next best thing was uh, me standing next to the Wax Museum uh, replica in 1977. <laughs> For some reason, I look like I'm about 40 years old. Ginger Rogers could go from sporty to sophisticated in a snap. She really could wear anything and RKO took a bevy of gorgeous portraits of her in this beautiful black gown. She wears the dress in the scene with a stare where he calls her bluff when she's trying to trick him. Uh, I love these behind the scenes photos of them together. I wish I, I wish I were a little mouse who could listen to what they were saying. Here's another Bernard Newman design that's a little bit over the top. It's got a lot of bows and it's double caped, double pleated. Um, fits in with the Art Deco design. Here she is with Bernard Newman and the wardrobe woman. And then here she is sitting on one of those famous leaning boards uh, that they had to sit on so that they wouldn't wrinkle the gowns. Here are a couple more costumes, this fancy beach bathing suit type costume and then an Asian inspired costume. Um, interestingly, this costume that she's wearing in these publicity photos with Fred was never worn in the film. And it must have had bad juju or something because she was supposed to wear it in a movie called Mother Carrie's Chickens 
that she was slated to be in, but she never made that film. It was made later with Anne Shirley in the starring role in 1938. And of course, I don't mean to ignore Fred's costumes uh, because he always looks so incredibly dapper, but I'll just show a couple here um, the way we all love him in his top hat, white tie, and tails. I would be remiss if I did not mention the most amazing supporting cast in films, uh, Edward Everett Horton, Eric Blore, Helen Broderick, and Eric Rhodes. They were all so unforgettable. In fact, you'll remember that Eric Rhodes always had that fake Italian accent. He also had it in the Gay Divorcee the year before. And I saw an interview with him when he was older and I heard his American accent and it was very jarring. I, I couldn't get used to it. I love the behind the scenes photos and here are some great ones of Ginger uh, on the RKO back lot. Uh, she's shown here with a fellow who would appear with her eventually in Follow the Fleet, uh, Ray Mayer. And then, of course, with her ever-present mother, who actually had an acting uh, studio on the RKO lot. Lucille Ball was one of her students. And I think it's funny that Ginger once said about her mother, it wasn't me dancing with Fred Astaire in those movies. It was my mother. Here's another great shot of Ginger in the Isn't This a Lovely Day to be Caught in the Rain scene. And she's actually at Griffith Park, um, which is where they shot uh, the scene where she's riding the horse. Um, here she is with Mark Sandridge, and uh, she loved Mark Sandridge. He was a, apparently a wonderful man, a wonderful director, and as I said, he directed her and Fred in three more movies after this one. And sadly, he died in 1945 at the age of 44. Here is Sandridge directing one of the scenes on the Venice Canal um, with the whole crew watching. That's Fred and Ginger in the uh, gondola. And then I love this scene of the chorus girls and the gondolier there. If you look closely, you'll recognize him as Alberto Morin. He played Rene Picard, uh, Maybelle Merriweather's boyfriend in Gone with the Wind. So if you're watching this video, you probably already know the story about Ginger and Fred getting into a bit of an argument about the dress she wears in the Cheek to Cheek number, which is a beautiful satin and ostrich feather dress that she helped design. And she was adamant about wearing it, even though as they were dancing, Fred was seeing that the feathers were falling on his suit, they were dropping on the floor and the camera was catching it. So it created a bit of an argument for them, but he acquiesced. They ended up um, with the dress in the dance number. It's absolutely gorgeous. It filmed beautifully, and he agreed in the end that she was right. But what most people don't know is that he gave her this beautiful traveling clock that was in a little uh, gold envelope sealed with enamel with a handwritten en engraving uh, to Ginger on the back, and he called her Feathers. That was her nickname after this incident. It was sold by Sotheby's at auction, and that is a piece of memorabilia I would love to have. Which leads me to my next point, which is that Fred and Ginger did get along beautifully. And over the years, there were rumors that they did not get along. And throughout the decades, they both denied this vehemently. They had a couple disagreements like the one we just mentioned but they adored each other and they both said it many times fred would say we never fought why do they keep saying that it's just for publicity and of course i love that they didn't uh that they loved working together they were both perfectionists they both always wanted the best uh performances possible and um it's wonderful that they got along as well as they did and kept in touch throughout the years uh, but you can tell from these photos, these are people that, that really enjoyed each other and enjoyed working together. And I, for one, will never stop being grateful for all the joy that they've brought to me and the rest of the world. Thanks for watching.